Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on the place of the world which you are tuning from. And thanks a lot again for inviting me to present in this awesome EV Journal Club, where I have already learned a lot from previous presenters. As Ken kindly mentioned, my name is Juan Pablo Tosar. I work in the University of the Republic in Uruguay and also at the Pasteur Institute of Montevideo. Um, and today I'm going to talk about extracellular TRNA hubs inside and outside extracellular vesicles. So why do we think these TRNA fragments are, are important? First thing to mention is that with the, with the, onset, with the um, development of high throughput sequencing technologies, it has become clear that TRNA fragments are produced inside virtually any cell. And we have different types of fragments. Shorter fragments are usually called TRF, while those fragments generated by endo, endonucleolytic cleavage at the anticodon loop are usually called TRNA halves. And 10 years ago, it was not clear whether these fragments uh, were actually functional, whether they, 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 they had a change inside the cell. But now there's quite a lot of evidence showing that, that in fact they are. They are a small RNA family which have been uh, shown to inhibit translation initiation. They can protect cells from stress-induced apoptosis. They are, they are neuroprotective. They enhance cancer cell proliferation, regulate mRNA stability, they regulate stress granule formation, contribute to intergenerational inheritance, they can regulate transposable elements, ribosome biogenesis, they are involved in T-cell activation, and they can directly interact, interact with different proteins such as translation initiation factors. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this because I think it's one of the best characterized mechanisms showing a function of a TRNA, a TRNA fragments. And this is mostly work from the from Paul Anderson and Pavel Ivanov's group. Uh, it's a group with uh, with whom we have been collaborating recently. So, as you all know, for an mRNA to be translated, it needs to be circularized, and this small ribosome unit needs to be placed at a specific site in the five prime UTR of the mRNA. And in order to accomplish this. The, 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 there's a recruitment of different translation factors uh, to the mRNA. And one important factor is EIF4X, which is composed of three proteins, EIF4E, which is a cup binding protein, EIF4A, and EIF4G, which is like the scaffold which interacts with different proteins such as poly A binding protein. And also, translation, cup dependent translation in mammals uh, needs the recruitment of the initiator TRNA methionine to the small ribosomal subunit, and this is accomplished by its, um, it is, this, this TRNA is carried by the factor EIF, EIF2 bound to GTP. So the two classical ways of regulating translation, uh, one is mTOR dependent, so we need to, translation is a very uh, costly process from an energetical point of view, so the cell needs to be sure that it has the sufficient amount of energy of amino acids and ATP in order to, to translate proteins. And in part, this is accomplished by mTORC1. So activated mTORC1 for folates for E binding proteins, thus um, um, free liberating EIF4E, which can now bind, bind to the cup and, and, and promote uh, translation. And a second mechanism is related to stress. So under stress, different types of stress converge in the phosphorylation of the translation initiation factor EIF42. So now phosphorylated EIF42 is no longer able to transport the initiation tRNA to the small ribosomal subunit. So this is like classical regulation of translation, but now it has uh, become clear that, that there are also other processes which are EIF42, uh, EIF2, sorry, uh, independent. So for example, under stress, there are RNAs A family members inside the cells, which are usually inhibited by their binding to, 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 a, to, the, to a binding partner, which is RNH1 in, 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 in mammals. So under stress, this, this complex dissociates, and now the RNAs, which, uh, so different RNAs A family members can, can have this function, but angiogenin is, the, 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 the one which has been better characterized, will now cleave different tRNAs at the anticodon loop. And only a small fraction of the tRNAs get cleaved. So this is roughly 1%. So there's still a general pool of tRNAs which are still there. So this is not a way of inhibiting translation by depletion of the tRNA pool. 
but by the generation of smaller RNAs such as these five prime tRNA halves. So when five prime tRNA halves are derived from alanine or cysteine tRNA, they can interact directly with EIF4G and thus um, recruit this uh, initiation uh, complex and in this way, translation initiation cannot uh, occur or at least it's altered. And how does this interaction take place? So this is something very interesting. These authors have shown that it's, it's, it is essential for this function, the presence of five consecutive one-ins in the five prime end of the five prime halves of alanine and cysteine tRNAs. And so these halves are able to tetramerize. So they form tetramers, which are stabilized by the interactions from these one-ins coming from different monomers. And they form interactions known as G quadruplex, which are formed by the interaction of four one-ins in the same plane plane coming from different molecules and interacted by uh, Huxtein-Huxtein interactions. So actually what interacts with EIF4G is possibly not the monomer but the tetramer and the same uh, proteins which uh, seem to interact with these tRNA halves such as IBX1 which by the way has been uh, shown to be involved in the release of the small RNAs to the extracellular space as well. So What's important for my talk today is to remember that RNA is not only a sequence, as we usually tend to, to think about it um, when we work with microRNAs, but it is also a structure. The sequence, of course, is very important because the sequence dictates the structure, but the structure in many, in, in many cases is it's what is important for, for the function. And it's also impact in RNA stability, which is a central concept for, for my talk today. So here you can see uh, the Naturin gel. So this is 8 molar urea. And you can see these uh, um, tetramers of alanine uh, tRNA halves. And they are still formed under the Naturin conditions. So these tetramers are highly resistant to denaturation. And RNA stability is also functionally important because it dictates RNA concentration. So these are kind of uh, important concepts to, to bear in mind uh, for, 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 for my talk. So, what do, do, do we know about tRNA-derived fragments in the extracellular space that I would like to talk about uh, today? So one of the first reports describing tRNA fragments in the, in the extracellular space was done by Sternold, De Hohen, and collaborators. And they purified the extracellular vesicles from immune cells, and they found that these vesicles contained uh, tRNA fragments. And they were not exactly the same tRNA fragments that they could find inside the cell. And also work from our labs, from uh, Alfonso Cachotov's lab um, in, in parasites, in human parasites like, like, like uh, the Panosoma cruci, show that this, this parasite is able to release vesicles to the extracellular space, and we could detect the, some uh, tRNA fragments inside these vesicles. And we also show that um, these tRNA fragments, or labeled tRNA fragments, could be transferred from parasites to other parasites and to mammalian cells and they seem to be important for uh, life cycle of this parasite and infection. And what happens in biofluids such as serum? So this is mainly work from uh, Joseph Javi and collaborators, where they show that in mouse serum, uh, here you can see in cells, so this is cell culture, this is northern blood, so you can see full length tRNAs and the tRNA fragment from glycine, from glycine five prime, these are glycine five prime halves, and here you can see in serum the detection of uh, glycine pipeline halves, but there's no uh, full length tRNA. And what's interesting is that the authors ultracentrifugated uh, serum and found that all the signal, most of the signal at least, remain in the supernatants. So these tRNA fragments do not seem to be associated with extracellular vesicles in, in, in serum. And same results were like reproduced by other groups. Which, which uh, mostly found 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 very found very similar they, they obtained very similar results, and something which is interesting is that in this work the authors showed that these tRNA fragments were highly stable in serum and they were also responsive to acute in, uh, inflammation. So when the authors injected the LPS into mice, they could see a rise in the concentration of this glycine and glutamic acid tRNA halves in serum. So. Then in 2015, we published uh, this work in collaboration with uh, Ken Whitwer, in which we purified different types of extracellular vesicles from different uh, human cell lines. 
and we use a, a very uh, routine ultrasound diffusion protocol. So we obtain uh, large EVs, small EVs, and we also obtain the 100,000 G supermutants, which we call the non EV or the ribonuclear protein fraction. So here you can see some uh, transmission electron microscopy, Western blood, and outside. So this is a characterization of these vesicles. And we perform small RNA sequencing in each of these fractions. So they are coming from the same cells. And we observe some interesting patterns. For example, for microRNAs, we observe a strong correlation between intracellular and extracellular relative abundances. And this was seen by sequencing, but also by validated by digital PCR. So basically, what we see is that what we saw was that the most abundant uh, microRNAs inside the cells tended to be the, more, the most abundant uh, microRNAs inside the cell. This was kind of controversial at that time, but uh, I think an important factor to, to understand these results is that we grew our cells under certain free conditions. So this, this has an impact, but well, we can talk about that later. But what's interesting is that we didn't find that for tRNA fragments. So for tRNA fragments, we have certain differences. Uh, in one hand, that there was a very weak correlation between those tRNA fragments, which we call sequence inside cells and outside cells. Outside cells in the extracellular space, and especially in the ribonuclear protein fraction, we mostly found five prime halves of glycine and glutamic acid tRNA halves of exactly 30 or 31 nucleotides. So there seems to be something special about this fragment, this fragment because they were found in serum, and now we, were, we, are, we are finding that they are highly enriched in the non vesicular fraction of uh, cell culture. And similar results were, were, uh, re were later uh, reported by, by other groups of all in different cellular models. And they were not only qualitative, uh, qualitatively different, but also there, there was a high quantitative enrichment. So here you can see the blue bars represents the percentage of mapped reads corresponding to tRNA fragments inside cells, in extracellular vesicles, and they compose the majority of the sequencing uh, uh, small RNAs uh, in the ribonucleoprotein protein fraction. So the ribonucleoprotein protein fraction is highly enriched in five prime halves of glycine and glutamic acid tRNAs of exactly 30 or 31 nucleotides. And this link is important for us. Come next. So two questions that we asked uh, ourselves were how do glycine and glutamic acid five prime tRNA halves avoid extracellular RNAs? Given that they are not protected inside extracellular vesicles, so for us that this was a quite intriguing question. And the second question is why and how are these, these fragments selected for release and so abundant in cell culture and biofluids? So it's also uh, important to mention that uh, recent work has also shown uh, and verified the, the enrichment of glycine and glutamic acid 5 prime tRNA halves in different biofluids. So this is a cell paper from last year that you probably know. So in serum, in bile, in urine, but also in CSF, the tRNA fragments which tend to be more abundant are always glycine and glutamic acid and their size range is typically 30, 31, 32 nucleotides. So why? How, how are so stable if they are not inside vesicles? So we thought that they should be forming a complex with a protein, and the protein should protect these uh, tRNA fragments in the transfer space. So we try to isolate the complex. And to do this, we, we purify the ribonuclear protein fraction by ultra centrifugation and inject it in a size exclusion chromatography column. And this is a typical chromatogram. So the red curve, the red curve is uh, the absorbent at 260. So this corresponds to the elution of nucleic acids. So we will see two peaks, which we call P1 and P2. And something which is important is if we amplify the uh, glycine tRNA fragments by stem loop uh, qPCR, they amplify exactly in these peaks. So in, P2, in P1, we could detect this uh, glycine tRNA halves. What's important is that P2 is the expected dilution volume for a small RNA of 30 nucleotides. And P1 is twice that size, so meaning that, that we had something bigger there. And we thought, OK, so here we have the protein with the uh, RNA. And purify the RNA with trisol, so there's no uh, there, there's no protein in there, 
and when re-injected the purified uh, fraction, we could still see that it eluded in exactly the same volume, meaning that their association with proteins was not sufficient to explain their shift in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in their uh, elution profile. So then we looked at the sequence and realized that it's, we could expect it to form a stem uh, loop uh, structure. So the five prime fragment, uh, the five prime end of the five prime fragments is forms a, a, a stem, but then there's a, um, an unstructured five prime tail. And when looking at this sequence, we realize that this sequence is in fact uh, self-complementary. So at least in theory, we could predict the formation of uh, homodimers of these uh, glycine tRNA fragments. And we thought maybe this is common for every tRNA fragment, and the answer is no. This seems to be a property of uh, glycine tRNA hubs. Uh, so other tRNA fragments are not expected to, 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 to form the same structures. So this is a, a structural prediction of the 3D structure, and you can see it, it's very nice in the sense that this is mostly double-stranded RNA, so we expect that this uh, dimer should be highly resistant to single-stranded ribonucleases. And we try to validate uh, these, these models. So first thing, um, we obtain synthetic oligonucleotides, and observe that this synthetic oligonucleotides eluded as a dimer, but if we change one nucleotide in order to, inter, to, to, to disrupt the, the dimerization interface, now these mutants, which we call 25UC, now they elute entirely as a monomer. And there's a linear relationship between the concentration of the dimer and the square of the concentration of the monomer, which is something expected for a monomer dimer equilibrium. And then we try different mutations. And for example, we change these two one-ins in this UGGU tetra loop for two adenines. So now there are no single-stranded one-ins in this structure. And we try, uh, we, we added ribonuclease T1, which cleaves after single-stranded one-ins. And we observed that these mutants are now highly resistant to, 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 to the action of this ribonuclease. In contrast, the mutant, which is not is highly sensitive. So, yeah, and, and we try different uh, ribonucleases with different activities, and then the main message is that these dimers are, are indeed uh, resistant to degradation by single-stranded RNAs. And then we transected these uh, biotinylated, biotinylated versions of these RNAs inside cells, uh, so we, we could detect them by uh, spectabidine coupled to a fluorochrome, and we transected the wild type sequence, the mutant which is not able to dimerize, or a scrambled sequence which, in which we, sh we, we just changed the, the order of the bases. And you can see that at the time zero post transfection, the levels of, of the, the efficiencies of transfection are pretty similar, but at six hours post transfection, the scrambled oligonucleotide and the mutant which is not able to dimerize, they are completely gone, so they have been degraded by the cell but the levels of the wild type sequence or the mutant which is able to dimerize, they, 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 are, they are still there. So these uh, RNAs are stable, not only in the exosphere space, also when transected inside, inside cells. So these kind of answers, uh, the first question, so how do glycine and glutamic acid fibrin tRNA have avoid exocellular RNAs, even they are not protected inside the bees? Maybe a possible answer is that because they form structures, RNA structures, which render these, these, these fragments to be highly stable against uh, single-stranded RNAs. And the second question is why and how are these fragments selected for release and so abundant in cell culture and in biofilms? So as I mentioned, we observed a low, correlate, a low correlation between the levels of these uh, of tRNA fragments inside and outside cells. And intuitively, we thought that if there is a low correlation, that, that means that there should be a selective enrichment of these fragments. So these fragments are, are somehow selected for release. Uh, so there should be a, a, a molecular mechanism inside the cell uh, dictating which tRNA fragments will be released to the exosphere space and which will not. But now we were aware that there was a second possibility. And the second possibility was that there's actually a high correlation between the intracellular and extracellular compartments, 
So there's no, no selective release necessarily, but then extracellular ribonucleases could chop, they could degrade most TRI fragments, and only those which are highly resistant to degradation will survive, and, and therefore they will accumulate. So both models could explain the same observation. So now we, we try to distinguish between uh, both models in order to understand how these TRI fragments are, 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 are released from cells. And uh, I think that the results were pretty uh, unexpected, at least, uh, at least for us. So we developed a method which we call a RISIC-SEC for small RNA sequencing of size exclusion chromatography fractions of cell conditioned medium treated with ribonuclease inhibitor. So basically what we did is just to add ribonuclease inhibitor to cell conditioned media um, after centrifugation. So there's no vesicle, extracellular vesicles in here and see how the extracellular RNA profiles change in one, uh, with and without uh, addition of ribonuclease inhibitor. So this, this is a typical size exclusion chromatogram. As I mentioned, the peaks uh, P1 and P2. This is what happens when you add uh, ribonuclease A. So the P1 is completely lost. So there's RNA in there. Here you can see the RNA, which is secret. And what the thing is, when we treat the cell condition medium with ribonuclease inhibitor, now we don't see this peak P2, sorry, and P1 is still there, but now there's a lot of, of absorbance uh, in the exclusion volume of the column, so this means high molecular weight RNA. So this high molecular weight RNA is actually ribosomal RNA, intact ribosomal RNA, so that's uh, where we start thinking in the possibility of extracellular uh, ribosomes, and that's the, the story which was, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, featured today. Um, and you can read it online or you can ask uh, later, but, but today I want to focus in TRNA fragments. What happens with TRNA fragments, which elude in this peak, which is called P1. And when we look at this uh, peak P1 with or without ribonuclease inhibitor, we can see that without RI, most of the RNAs in this P1 peak are small RNAs of 30, 31 nucleotides, uh, meaning that they are eluding in, in a peak which is twice their size and their non-denaturing conditions, possibly because they are forming dimers. But when we have a ribonuclease inhibitor, now we see most RNAs. So there are some fragments, but most of them are intact uh, full-length tRNAs. And by sequencing, we observe some interesting patterns. For example, with ribonuclease inhibitor, which is shown in black, the fragments of glycine tended to be larger than without. So without ribonuclease inhibitor, most of the fragments were precisely 30 nucleotides, and those are the sequences which are capable of forming dimers, and those which are highly stable. With ribonuclease inhibitor, most of them corresponded to the expected um, cleavage site by angiogenin or other RNA-safe family members at the anticodon loop of the mature tRNA. And even though we didn't use a sequencing uh, method uh, intended for the amplification of full lengths or the uh, um, retrotranscription of full length tRNAs, we could still detect some sequences corresponding to full length tRNAs. So basically, we, we know that there are full length tRNAs in the extracellular space when we add ribonuclease inhibitor. So, in order to, 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 we then try to say, okay, what comes from, 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 from dead cells and what is actual, actively released from cells? We thought in just washing the cells briefly with different buffers. So here I'm showing results with HBSS, which is like PBS, but it also contains glucose. But, and only after, and we use a conditioning time of only 30 seconds. So we just add buffers to the, uh, add the buffer to the cells, wait for 30 seconds and analyze what is in this cell conditioning uh, buffer. And an important uh, thing to mention, to, to, to notice, is that this is uh, iodixanol gradients. So these are the fractions where we will expect um, vesicular RNA. So most of the RNA, um, which we will find in the cell conditioned buffers after 30 seconds of interaction with cells, were outside vesicles. So they were part of this ribonucleoprotein compartment. And when we look for tRNA fragments by northern blood, we could detect that uh, full-length tRNA fragments of glycine could be, could be detected in this cell-conditioned uh, wash. 
and there was some fragments. And then we, 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 we took this soil condition wash and just incubated uh, in a salt free scenario, uh, just in the uh, 37 degrees. And we could see, we, we could start observing that there's a, some degree of fragmentation of these TRNAs and the formation of some fragments. But those fragments tended to be the larger ones, sorry, the ones of 35. What happened when we incubated this cell conditioned HBSS with serum? So now we are adding 10% um, serum and mixing uh, both fractions. And in just one hour, we see a complete disappearance of the full length TRNA band and an accumulation of fragments. But now these fragments are those of 31 or 30 nucleotides. So meaning that in a, when, when the sample is highly, is highly contains a lot of RNAs such as in serum, those fragments which accumulate are those which are derived, uh, are those which, which are capable of forming dimers, sorry. But one, one important aspect is where do these fragments of TRNA glycine came, come from? Did, did they come from the cells themselves? And the answer is no, they, are, they were generated by extracellular fragmentation of full length TRNAs. And what happens is more like, uh, in a, in a more like a routine uh, experiment in which we are analyzing cell conditioning medium in the presence of serum and after a longer conditioning time of uh, say 40 to 24 hours. So now we are looking, uh, this is Northern block for different uh, tRNAs. So this is lysine, methionine and glycine. And you can detect one hour, five hour, 24 hours. In all the cases, we could detect the presence of the full length tRNAs. But what's important is, we, and in the cells, we will see the full TRNA band, but we will not see the band which corresponds to the fragments. And this is important because this, what, what happens here is that the fragmentation of TRNAs inside cells occurs under stress. And these are non stress cells. So non stress cells do not contain a significant amount of uh, full length, uh, sorry, of, of TRNA fragments. There are TRNA and you can sequence them and you can amplify them by qPCR but that's those are very sensitive techniques uh, they are not um, above the sensitivity of these uh, cold northern blocks and what's interesting here is that now we have serum and why are we observing these uh, tRNAs uh, in the presence of serum but in this experiment I'm not separating a bis from the ribonucleoprotein compartment so to do this I perform a density gradient fractionation. So this is a ionic gradient. So here you can see fraction three and four are those which correspond to extracellular vesicles. Here you can see what's some role for CD9 and CD81. And inside the vesicles, now we see RNA. And when we look for TRNAs, uh, TRNA fragment for, for, for by northern blood, we were not able to detect any TRNA fragments in the vesicular fractions but we detect a lot of, or at least most of the signal corresponded to full length uh, TRNAs. So this is in agreement with a previous report from Sheckman and Lambowitz group in which they show that extracellular vesicles mostly contain a full length TRNAs, not, not fragments. But what's interesting is that in the non-vesicular fractions, which are these ones over here, there were virtually no full length TRNAs but now there was the accumulation of uh, glycine uh, TRNA half of 30 nucleotides. So here we are seeing a mix of this, but when we dissociate this, so the full length TRNAs come from the vesicles and the fragments are present in the non-vesicular uh, fraction. So as a summary of what I've shown, a cell contains a lot of TRNAs and vesicles also contain a full length TRNAs. And it also seems to be the case that full length TRNAs are released to the non vesicular uh, compartment, but then extracellular RNAs will cleave these non vesicular TRNAs, and most of the fragments will be degraded, but those which are derived from glycine and glutamic acid, possibly because they form dimers, but there might be other reasons, they accumulate because they seem to be highly resistant to degradation. However, in the side, those TRNAs which are found inside the vesicles, they are resistant to, to these RNAs and they will still be uh, found inside the vesicle. And now one of the questions that we are trying to answer in the lab is what, what is the function of these uh, dimers 
of uh, glycine and glutamic acid uh, TRNA hubs. What happens? How, how, uh, are, are, are other cells able to recognize them and sense them in some way? And another question we are trying to, 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 to answer is what happens? So this is true for non-stress cells, but what happens under stress? So under stress, we expect that uh, some TRNAs will be cleaved, will be cleaved, sorry, and will have formation of TRNA halves, so stress-induced TRNA halves. And we ask, uh, are the changes in the intracellular RNAome followed by changes in the extracellular RNAome? So it could be the case that non-stress cells do not contain TRNA fragments, but the inside the vesicles, but the vesicles coming from stress cells contain uh, TRNA fragments, and this might be involved in intercellular communication. Uh, we think this could be important for like a message of, of from stress cells to non-stress cells, like saying, okay, so I'm stressed here. But we are working on that, and some, um, some experiments we have performed that have been recently published is, so to answer the question, are the intracellular RNA profiles reflected in the extracellular space? So with infected cells with these uh, glycine uh, wild type uh, sequences or mutants which cannot dimerize or, or scramble oligonucleotides, and we looked for their presence inside vesicles and in cells exposed to those extracellular vesicles. So in acceptor cells, we looked at these RNAs because we transfected with biotinylated versions of these RNAs. We, 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 we can detect them by uh, a microscopy. And here you can see that only, we could only detect the wild type sequence inside the acceptor cells. So the mutants which cannot dimerize and the scrambled sequence were not detectable. But when we look, sorry, at their levels inside the vesicles by qPCR, we could detect the scrambled oligonucleotide also inside the vesicles. So what we think is going on here is that when we transect cells with an RNA which is not stable, that RNA is able to be released inside the extracellular vesicles, but if it is transferred to acceptor cells, it will be rapidly degraded. Uh, so this highlights the importance of working, of working with highly stable RNAs in order to, to, to study this um, transference from, 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 from one cell to another. And we hope that if we increase the concentration of the RNA used for transfection, we could also increase their concentration inside vesicles and the concentration in acceptor cells exposed to those vesicles. So this is a summary um, of some things I've shown and some speculation and ideas and experiments we are performing. Uh, that, uh, that we have recently written a review with uh, Alfonso Coyote about this. Um, we like to see this problem in the following way. So a cell contains tRNAs, most of the tRNAs or some of the tRNAs are engaged in translation, but there are some free tRNAs which are amenable to their release in the extracellular space, either in exosomes or in microvesicles. So we will find full length tRNAs inside vesicles. Additionally, Cells are able to release TRNAs through the non-vesicular space. These TRNAs probably come from dead cells, but this deserves a better exploration. But what's important is that these TRNAs uh, are cleaved by extracellular RNAs, and we will have formation of some fragments. Some fragments will be degraded, but some fragments will, will would be stabilized, maybe because they are associated with proteins or because they form dimers or tetramers. Um, uh, those runs will, 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 will accumulate. So we are trying to understand if they have some uh, signaling potential. But then what's inter interesting is what happens in a stress cell. So a stress cell will, will generate a TRA fragments inside the cell. And we expect that by increasing the intracellular concentration of TRA fragments, now we will have vesicles containing these TRA fragments and we, we, are, we are wondering how will cells respond when they uptake vesicles containing uh, TRNA fragments. Remember, these TRNA fragments are potent inhibitors of global translation, so their effects might be uh, broad. And we are considering the possibility that these TRNA fragments might be involved in intercell communication in a stress, uh, in a model of, of, of cellular stress. 
So uh, this is all um, I have prepared for today. So I want to thank um, all the people from, from my lab at Universidad de la Republica and from Alfonso Cayota's lab at Institute Pastor of Montevideo. Uh, and also uh, some great collaborator, collaborators like uh, Ken Whitware, uh, John Hopkins, and Eric Westhoff uh, has also helped a lot with the dimerization story of uh, guys internet hubs. And we have been recently collaborating with Pavel Ivanov and Paul Anderson uh, at BWH um, regarding this process, a cellular biogenesis of uh, small RNAs. So I will also want to thank the funding agencies, our national funding agencies. So we are also forming part of the NIH Extracellular RNA Communica Communication Consortium in a project which is led by Ken Whitwer. So this is um, the university where I work, the Pasteur Institute of Montevideo. And as you can see, both, both labs are in the same campus uh, in a beautiful city, which is Montevideo, which is uh, close to the beach, which is by the beach, actually. And you are invited to come and visit once this uh, COVID situation will, will, once we will recover from the situation and we will be able to, to uh, travel again. So thank you very much. And I will be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you a lot, Juan Pablo, for presenting today. Um, I think you've, uh, you've, you've shown us a lot of things uh, and they've raised a few questions for people. Uh, so I have gone ahead and allowed all participants to unmute themselves now. So I would just like to, um, to ask that we go through the questions in order right now. Um, so we'll start with, uh, with Roger Alexander. Roger, uh, you had a couple of questions for Juan Pablo. Uh, Juan Pablo, can you hear me? <laughs> this is beautiful work. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if you have an idea about, uh, I was wondering what was going on and then you, it made sense that maybe the tRNA is being ex excreted, secreted not in EVs come from dead cells. And I wonder if you have an idea how to prove that. It seems like they could be those surviving dimers, so the glide dimers could be like a paracrine signal of nearby cell death. And then maybe the ones that are in EVs coming from cells that are under stress could be a longer distance um, signal of stress. In the that's, that's exactly how we tend to see this, uh, how we try to make sense of, 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 of these results. Because I'm not showing, showing it here, but in the non vesicle space, we are not only detecting full length TRNAs, but we are also detecting full length ribosomes. So length ribosomal RNA with all the ribosomal proteins. So it's very hard to us to, 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 to think in an active way of uh, releasing ribosomes from lip cells. And that's why we tend to think that this material comes from dead cells, even though we try very, very hard to avoid any induction of cell death in, in our cultures. That's usually uh, unavoidable. And part of the idea of washing the cells with, with buffer was just trying to get rid of what was uh, previously released from dead cells. But then we found out that just by doing these washes with certain free media, some cells will be detaching and, and they will be releasing their, their, their components. So the most plausible explanation for us today is that what the main source of non-vesicular RNA uh, at least this long, long, uh, well, they are not, not long non-coding RNAs, but full length RNAs and, and ribosomal RNAs, they are coming from, from, from dead cells. But those which are found inside the vesicle, those might be important because those might harbor a signal impotation. But I also want to, to I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't have time to, to, to show some, 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 some data, but I also want to, um, to, to, to highlight a, a concept that even if the, the RNAs are coming from dead cells, that does not mean that they, they do not work in intercellular communication. Because we, we have some, some, some data showing that uh, dendritic cells exposed to these extracellular ribosomes, so these fractions containing this non vesicular uh, RNA, high, uh, they strongly react to them. Uh, so we think that these non-vesicular RNAs might be uh, involved in 
some source of um, they might work as damage associated molecular patterns or, 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 or something like that. So it's a different way of thinking in intercellular communication, but, but I think it's still very interesting. Good. Then um, we also had a question from Pablo. Pablo, uh, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That is that was a wonderful talk, Juan Pablo. Um, and my question is um, similar, uh, a little bit um, similar to the one that Roger did. I was thinking you were using this osteosarcom cell, like the U O. Uh, U O S. Yes. I'm wondering if the metabolism of this um, cell would affect the release of the fragment. Thinking if this result will vary it in a primary cell culture situation, and particular in, in I'm thinking in neurons when you don't have uh, a cell that are dividing, you have differentiated neurons, and if you will, what do you expect in a, in, in two scenario one? Low metabolic cells that are not constantly dividing, uh, dividing uh, with low serum maintenance, and in um, other scenario, primary cell culture they are not they are differentiated. Yeah, th thank you, Pablo. That, that that's a very good question. So, uh, in fact, we, we tried we, we tried quite a lot of cell lines. Uh, I showed some results in usual vessels, but. Most of these results were also reproduced in, in different uh, cell lines, but they were usually uh, human cancer cell lines. But we also worked with um, with primary uh, with called uh, with cell line from um, fibroblast, so that's senescent uh, uh, cell. It's not an immortalized uh, uh, cell line, and we observe the same. But we haven't tried uh, neurons or real primary cultures yet. So uh, in principle, it's possible uh, that there might be differences. But at least what it was different types of cells that we have tried, um, we, we, there, there were, of course, quantitative differences in the levels of uh, extracellular RNAs, but there were not qualitative uh, differences, even when working with um, Primary fibroblasts, uh, not really but a non uh, culture of, of, of fibroblasts. So uh, neurons is is kind in the, is, is in the to do list, uh, and yes, I think it's something that we'll have to to look at. Uh, and also there might be so we are uh, kind of seeing is that what by the cell will highly repercuting what we'll find outside the cell, but not directly because there's also extracellular processing. So, uh, but, but yes, it's the primary source of what we will find outside the cell. So if we have cells in um, their different uh, metabolic constraints that we expect that, 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 will be some, that, that, that will be somehow reproducing the extracellular space as well. So I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, uh, no, I think it, it is, will be very interesting, and, and particularly because you mentioned uh, when you were discussing with Roger that they, this um, uh, fragment can have uh, uh, also uh, uh, um, uh, kind of signaling effect in the other cell, and, or in, and I'm thinking if this can do in, in dendritic cell or paracrine cells uh, signaling. I, I was uh, wondering it would be would be nice to try neurons too, but yeah, thank you, Hampas. Well, thank you for the suggestion. Our next question is from one of my co-hosts, uh, Tom. Hi, Tom, are very you nice work. There you are. Um, Hi, so indeed, we've also observed in 2018 that vesicles from uh, dendritic cells contain mainly uh, full-length tRNA, shipped by Western blot, uh, sorry, Northern blot. So that really matches your data. I was wondering about uh, tRNA cleavage. Uh, most studies uh, use very strong stressors to induce this type of cleavage. So uh, are there also physiological stressors that can do a similar thing that you know of? Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, so, so what we are showing is that there, 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 there is 
um, there is non-stress related DNA cleavage in the extracellular space. So the extracellular mm -hmm. space is RNAs and these RNAs will cleave those tRNAs which they found uh, outside the cells. Something which is interesting is that different tRNAs have different uh, half-lives. So glycine seems to be one of the most susceptible to, 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 to cleavage, and that might also explain why it generates more uh, more more, more of these So tRNA cleavage in the extracellular space, I think it's 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 not necessarily related to stress, it's just related to the fact that the exosphere space is full of uh, ribonucleases. Inside the cells, so I'm, we don't work in that uh, aspect so much, but our collaborators uh, do. And yes, I agree with you that uh, sodium arsenide is usually used as a, like a prototype inductor of uh, tRNA cleavage, and it's a its, its effects are, are, are broad. Uh, it's not so. I'm um, I'm not I'm not really sure about whether uh, physiological stress will induce um, a significant amount of, of tRNA fragmentation. But something which is uh, very I think it's very interesting is that now 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 there are some some studies performed in uh, in cells which lack the angiogen inhibitor. So in that case, so the angiogen inhibitor is a very interesting mm -hmm. product because it's, 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 it's expressed at high levels and it has the highest affinity uh, for, 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 so the interaction between angiogen and its inhibitor is the highest uh, affinity interaction known for, for any protein protein. So it's close to the spertavidin biotin uh, interaction. And that's, in a way to ensure, the cell needs to be sure that there's no free uh, ribonuclease in the cytoplasm when, when it is not uh, desirable, because it will be toxic. Uh, now there's some knockout cells in which this uh, ribonuclease inhibitor is, 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 is knocked out, and you could think that now there will be an uncontrolled fragmentation of tRNAs, and that's not the case. So these uh, knockout cells are make these tRNA fragments in a constitutive way, so you know you don't need to add a stressor in order to see these fragments by, by northern blood. But some level of, of tRNA fragments as, as wild type cells under stress. So this tells uh, that there's, there's probably a mechanism which kind of buffers regulate the levels of these tRNA fragments so that they, 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 they can never go too high because too high they might be uh, toxic and maybe one way is just a release to the exosphere space in, in that cycle. Very good. Um, we have a question now from Esther Naltatun. Esther. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice uh, presentation. It was really great work. Um, I have a question about uh, the last part of your presentation where you showed uh, the transfer of uh, tRNAs or tRNA fragments to uh, recipient cells. Do you really have evidence that it ends up in the cytoplasm of these cells? And in connection with that, uh, do you think or can you speculate on whether tRNA fragments or even the dimers uh, might be recognized by uh, uh, sensors like Rig I or MDA5? Yeah, so this is what, what we have uh, by the moment. We can see in the cytoplasm, but it seems to be uh, in initial experiments we tended to see a more like a, like um, a signal, but then we, we changed we changed some some some, some protocols and, and now we can see that the signal is quite uh, dispersed in the cytoplasm. But uh, this could still be uh, like we, 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 we we still don't know whether this all this signal will go, like for example, to lysosomes, and it will the destiny of this foreign RNA would be uh, degradation. We we are working on that. Um, and regarding those fragments which are present in which are present outside vesicles, so these dimers of glycine tRNA halves, which are outside EVs, but they are stable outside EVs and they will accumulate. Yes, we think that if they have a Function in acceptor cells, 
that is going to be possibly um, by their binding to uh, receptors in the cell surface or in the surface of endosomes. Um, they might, uh, so for interaction with the rig eye, for example, they probably need to, 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 to escape from, from, from endosomes. We, we don't know how, if they are uptaking, so there's still uh, a lot of work uh, to do in, in that sense. So sorry, I, I cannot uh, give a more um, detailed answer to your question because we, we still. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Roger, uh, Roger Alexander, you have a couple of more questions. So early on, you mentioned the, um, how the, the five prime tRNA fragments bound to EIF4 in a G quadruplex structure. Um, do you think that that um, structure is important for full length tRNAs binding to that complex as well? And just more generally, I, I kind of lost track of how that connected to the later story. Uh, yeah, so I would start uh, by, 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 by the end. Um, there's no uh, direct link between that uh, results, which are from, 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 from other groups and, and our story, uh, because they are different tRNAs. So that, that's true. From information true for allergy and different tRNA halves, and we could reproduce the 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 the, the total information in, in our lab as well. So they, they, they do from tetromers at least uh, synthetic oligonucleotides. Um, and it's not directly connected to our story, which is related to glycine uh, tRNA half which form uh, dimers. That's that, that's what we think. But I wanted to introduce that those reports to stress the idea that these tRNA fragments not necessarily work as microRNAs, so they will, be, they will bind to a protein and their sequence will detect, will dictate their interactions. Maybe yes, but we also need to bear in mind the kind of structures that they might be forming and that, it, that the structural, like they might work at more as like aptamers like, than like uh, microRNAs. So that's why, that's the reason why I introduced them. Um, but yes, you're you correct in that there was not like a, a direct link, link uh, between what's um, going on there. And uh, regarding these tetromers can form for full length tRNAs, I don't think so because these uh, warnings in the full length tRNAs they are interacting with the prime prime end of the tRNA, so they are, they are not uh, in a single stranded. Um, they are they are not single stranded, but once that you cleave these uh, tRNAs by the anticodon loop, you will release these fibrin tRNA halves, and then you will have these fibrin bindings, and you have four molecules, they will, they, 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 they will, they will associate. So that, um, so that G quadruplex structure could be a structure identified to recognize fragments. And it makes sense that you use that to motivate your point about dimerization of the fragments in this and the extracellular space, which leads to my last question, which is, am I right that you said that um, in biofluids, you see a lot of fragments of five prime fragments of glycine and was it glutamine? Um, but only the glycine can form that dimer. So wh why is that other one also surviving? Well, th thank you for that question. So, so yes, um, so this uh, service of, um, in biofluids were not performed by, by us, but by, by uh, other groups, and they tend to always observe the same, that glycine and glutamic acid fibrin tRNA halves are, are by far the most abundant. And I showed that glycine could form homodimers, uh, and the glutamic acid fibrin tRNA halves cannot, at least, at least the synthetic ones uh, cannot, but we have previously published that they can form heterodimers with glycine uh, tRNA halves. So that, that, what, that can be one explanation. They are not able to form, glycine is able to form homodimers, and glutamic acid apparently is not, but it can form heterodimers with uh, glycine tRNA halves, which are highly, which are very similar to, to homodimers of, of, of glycine. Uh, 
be another explanation as well. I, I, I don't want to, um, to disregard the possibility that there might be proteins which uh, interact with these fragments in the external space and therefore they, they, they protect these fragments specifically. What I tried to, to explain is that just because we take a snapshot and see what's in the exosphere space, we cannot directly infer that those fragments were directly released from cells. It might be the result of a process uh, which occurs in the exosphere space, and we are typically not able to, to we are typically not seeing that because it's, it's a fast, uh, it's fast turnover of 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 current. Thanks, and I, I guess those heterodimers might explain the relative abundance in the biofluid data. You would never expect to see more um, glutamic acid than glycine fragments. Yeah, um, so in, 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 in our soil culture experiments, so glycine uh, CRM fragments are, are, are high. Uh, I will really need to check the literature uh, to, to double check that that's always the case. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Good, so we have um, one final question from Lilia and about subtypes of EVs. Lilia, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Thank Hi. you for your talk. Just a very quick question. I've seen that you performed the EV isolation of the large and small vesicles. Have you seen any interesting observation um, in comparison to the large and, and small EV content in CRNA? Okay, so um, when we do the separation between large and small EVs, uh, that just by uh, ultracentrifugation, and when we sequence these those fractions, we, we we did not see any difference regarding the composition of TRNA uh, or small RNAs in general. But to be honest, that's a very crude separation, and we we have like say much more small EVs than large EVs. Then there would be like some small EVs will contaminate our large EV preps and they, they, they can be uh, uh, And then we will do density gradient, density gradient fractionation, but in that, in that in those cases, we did not separate large and small EVs. So we, are, we, we were only analyzing EVs in general. Um, so regarding your, your question, yes, it is possible that if we couple like uh, 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 a good separation technique, um, and, and we try to look at different vesicular populations, there might be differences in the small RNA composition regarding uh, tRNAs and tRNA fragments. But um, we, we, I don't think we have the, the best experiments to, to, to answer that question, to, to answer that, that, that specific question. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this EV Journal Club. Um, so thank you so much, Juan Pablo Tosar, um, for joining us today and for sharing your work. Um, I think it's been very educational for, for all of us. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining. And I hope that everybody has a wonderful rest of your day or your night, depending on where you are. And we hope to see you again uh, next week. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Hi, thank you.